Hello, and welcome back to Industry Tactics, a podcast interviewing some of the finest weirdos in music today. And this is my talk with Brian Poole and David Jansen, otherwise known as Ronaldo and the Loaf. They've been around since the 70s making experimental music uh, out of Great Britain. And, um, and they went to San Francisco and recorded with The Residents and, and, and their label, Ralph Records. Really exciting stuff to be able to uh, sit down and connect with two heroes of mine. Uh, when I was growing up as a, as a teenager, I, my buddy Matt Daly, Matt, this one's dedicated to you. He got me hooked on this music. This is the music of Ronaldo and the Loaf, an interview I, I had recently over Skype, and I do apologize for the audio quality of this recording, but uh, it's a fantastic interview. Two guys, friends since the 70s, making music together and, and developing uh, their friendship over the years over music, which is a really beautiful thing. This is my chat with Brian Poole and David Jansen. Ronaldo and the Loaf, ladies and gentlemen, sit back and prepare to be dazzled. When I unplugged the headphones, I couldn't hear you. Oh, okay. Well, you know what? Bizarre. You sound great. I mean, I don't mind talking a little louder if it helps. <laughs> oh, I can hear you okay, okay Rich. Uh, 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 Dave was a bit faint, that's all. Okay. Well, if it's okay with you, I, I think we've got clearance here. Do you guys Are you guys okay to go for it? Yeah, why not? Yeah, sure. All right, and you both have two distinct voices, so I won't have trouble knowing who's speaking. This is great. I haven't put a funny voice on yet. No, I'm, wait I'm waiting for it, but we'll get there. <laughs> uh, uh, Brian, hey? have, you got your, have you got your hat on? No, should I? <laughs> no, I haven't. Just, it's just, just too uncomfortable for social things. <laughs> well, I want to thank you. Welcome to the podcast, Industry Tactics. Right. Great to be here. We've yeah. got we've got Brian Poole and David Jensen, Ronaldo and the Loaf. Ole, everybody. <laughs> Aye. It's it's a very special day, gentlemen. Uh, it's no problem. So where does this find you guys? Where are you living? You Brian, you're in Portsmouth? Yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> and David? I'm in Wales. I'm in a little town in mid Wales called Rayada. How do you spell that? R H A Y A D E R. Rioter, okay, right on. And and have you both? How far is that from from Brian? Like, how far do you guys live? Oh, what is it? A couple of hundred miles, is it, Brian? Yeah, just over two two hundred and twenty odd miles, something like that. Oh wow! So to get together is uh, is work. Yeah. Uh, no, it's always pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should rephrase that. It's it's always pleasure. Yeah, good. Um, no, it's okay. I'll, I'll get to drive over to visit uh, Dave, perhaps a couple of times a year. Okay, okay. And do you work collaboratively using uh, technology? Like, it, uh, we're, we're Skyping this call in, obviously, now, but um, how do you, co I mean, if we might just get right into it, how do you collaborate on projects together living so far away? Mainly, mainly file, file sharing, really. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, we do that. We talk on the phone a lot. Okay. Yeah. Just bounce ideas backwards and forwards and... Uh... I mean, it's that kind of thing is so much easier with um, digital technology than when we were using tape. Because, okay. What I I don't know about Brian, but what I always uh, I always found was that once you'd cut the tape and uh, committed to a course of action, there was no go, there was no undo. Right. You know, whereas uh, now we've got almost infinite undo. We can go back. We can change things. We can add things. It's mm -hmm. uh, there's just a lot more versatility, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it makes the decision making process a lot more difficult too. Yeah, you know, I, I imagine having so much flexibility. Whereas as Dave's right. I mean, in the, you know, in the old days, we'd possibly turn a song round in in an afternoon. Uh, you know, and uh, and that's it. We just say, I'll move on to the next thing, and. Uh, I suppose now with, with with the digital technology, we we have various stages the song goes through and refinements and comments we make and things like that. I mean, like like anybody that's collaborating, except um, you know we, we we have to do it at distance. Right. Well, um, thanks. We're into it here. I want to. For me, you know, it was all about walking around my hometown as a teenager. I, I grew up in Brampton, Canada. 
and uh, listening to CD mixes of your music. Uh, this would have been in the mid '90s, I guess. Uh, my best friend Matthew Daly kind of tipped me off on 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 your sound and your music, and you know, it hit me at that perfect time in my life. I was I, I was immersing in weirdo culture, and uh, you guys were. I, I want to know kind of from from your end. Like I've got all of your music in the back of my brain. You know, it's it had a, a serious impact on my on my development as a musician. I want to know like who the Ronaldo and the Loaf was in your lives when you were growing up and and got you hooked on music making. Well, the yeah, reason we yeah. actually came together in the first place probably is, yeah, eh? Tyrannosaurus Rex was the earliest um, yeah. big influence for both of us, I'd say. That's yeah, really that's... what started us off on uh, making music together, our mutual um, love of Tyrannosaurus Rex. We both had acoustic guitars, and um, I suppose our earliest, uh, the, the earliest things we did were kind of... Um, in the vein of Tyrannosaurus Rex, kind of imitating them, but not exactly because we never ever um, set out to learn to play other people's songs. It was in the vein of, but in in our own uh, style. Yeah, it's, it's like we. That's why we sort of you know stayed a duo. Because right. the original Tyrannosaurus Rex being a duo, um, I suppose subconsciously that that's how we felt we we would always be. Huh. And so we never aspired to conventional band setup or anything like that. So it's always been you two since the beginning, pretty much. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I love that. I really find that it's uh, that's, uh, that's charming. So that's been over how many years now? The late seventies, I would say, right? Mm-hmm. Or earlier. Well, we've known each other and been playing music, as as Dave said, since probably about nineteen seventy seventy one. Wow. The first music. Seventy. Yeah. Um, Wow. Uh, we we met in the school art room. That's you, right. We met in the school art room. I was sixteen, going on seventeen, and Brian was a year old. Seventeen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So basically, D- Dave was doing a drawing um, of a, I think it was a Transformers Rex album cover or something. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And okay. I said, oh, you know, do do you like them? And uh, he said, yeah. And I was doing a drawing based on a Transformers Rex song. Okay. Uh, and that's how our, you know, friendship started, and based on that mutual like of Tyrannosaurus Rex, and then then we just found that, I don't know, we just sort of um, had similar tastes for a while. Then what was interesting is that as we started playing music and listening to different stuff, the kinds of records we were listening to diverged a bit, and that made an interesting mix, you know, Dave was saying, have you heard this? And I was saying, oh, have you heard this? In, you know, it, it sort of informed us in different ways. What attracted you to, to that music? <laughs> there was n- nothing else really like it, the use of voices, but because they only um, had an acoustic guitar and uh, bongo drums, um, they used to do a lot of things with voices that I think had they the... The, the money and the uh, expertise, they would have used other instruments, but they used to do a lot of things where they'd use voices in uh, quite interesting ways. Yeah. Actually, it hadn't occurred to me that, Dave, um, when you think about it, you, that's quite right. Uh, yeah, they would, you know, you'd almost sort of think that they were treating their voice in some way, but Mark Boland's voice was very, very dexterous. At the time, Steve Took, who he was playing with, could you know, make some interesting harmonies with him. And uh, that um, maybe that's what inspired us as well. Mm. Wow, I love it because I, I'm very inspired by your use. And I want to get into it later about kind of your sound and what makes it so special to me. But part of it is that, you know, you've almost created, to me, you've, you've created your own language by cutting up the English language and just a, a, a very different approach to to sound and production in general, but a, a lot of what uh, is at the core of it for me is that you, it's very, it sounds very simple and I kind of want to get into it. It blows my mind to this day when I hear your stuff saying, how the hell did they do that? Well, to a certain extent, we, we look back and say, now how the hell did we do that? Yeah. Um, we, you know, we have certain memories of how things were done. Uh, if, you, if you had a specific track in mind, we, we might be able to 
remember. At this point, why don't we? I wanted to start by playing something from uh, Struve and Snef. And maybe uh -huh. maybe we can start by playing. Uh, I don't know. Do you have a track off of that record that we can kind of talk about? Anything that you remember? Okay, sounds okay. interesting. What uh, like what what would you recommend we play? I could play anything from it. What would you recommend, and we can kind of talk about it? Oh boy. Okay. Um, it, uh, Dave, you choose. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Um. I was hoping you were going to have something in mind, Rich, and play well, it. Well, I'm happy to play. I mean, uh, the, well, the, that tune that I covered is Scottish Shuffle. That's a that's a, a favorite. Okay. okay, yeah. Do you? What are your memories from when that that tune was made? Like, where were you? What kind of gear were you using? I don't know. Whatever else, whatever comes to mind. Well, basically, well, two two electric guitars. The backing loop. The, uh, right at the back is um, the, the the hissy sound is actually a, an aerosol spray can. Amazing. And um, the the other sound is kind of just pressing the strings against the pickup. And then, and then the guitar it. over the top is played. Uh, we were both playing um, hammered guitar, weren't we, Brian? Yeah, we did, we played hammered. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then you had that your famous backward uh, lead guitar bit. <laughs> yeah, of course. That's part of the sound. And, um, and where were you? Where was it recorded? Uh, Dave's um, uh, my, my, my Randy, Randy's house. So in in uh, Rioter? No, oh, no, no this in, is Portsmouth. In, in Portsmouth. We were both living in Portsmouth. Okay, you made those records both living in Portsmouth. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Uh, yeah, but uh, just yeah, D Dave lived round the corner from me. Um, obviously, we went to the same school, and uh, he lived round the corner. And uh, so, I can't remember if Scottish Shuffle was actually done on the was it done on the the four track, Dave? Yeah, it yeah, was. We it was 1980. And and how how old are you around that time? Like just ballpark. 1980. Oh, I've been 27. Wow, guys, this is amazing! It's such a bloody honor. I'm going to stop geeking out and move on. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Unless any other memories on on Scottish Shuffle are, are there for you? Well, there's the backward vocal bit, of course. Which, oh uh, yes, yeah. The rock cod vocals. Yeah. The shall shall we dance? Okay. Shall yeah. we dance? This, this, <laughs> this, this was something we discovered <laughs> completely by accident. Yeah. Uh, I I just had the idea that um, if you took a phrase. Yeah. And set it backwards and ran the tape backwards and then so you recorded it backwards and then played it forwards would so it would sound like normal speech but all the stresses and the accents are in the wrong place and that's, and, that's how we did and it sounds the, scottish when, when an english voice does it it sounds scottish unbelievable formula so. uh, anyway a little backstory quickly on that is that um we, we call it the rock cod voice and you may wonder why rock cod features in our stuff and you know um i mean our production company is called rock cod productions okay uh it used to be on the telly in the uh 60s uh uh a sort of um i don't know what you call it just a, a show like a, a, a drama mm -hmm. called dr finley's case book okay and it was it was based in scotland and it was very funny <laughs> in the sense when you saw it back when you know in this sort of uh uh, late 70s or 80s it was so cheesy and uh and we just sort of thought that uh, our scottish voices sounded like um those actors and so the idea of doctor was used um which then we of course extend into the idea of doctoring sound and stuff like that wow doctoring sound and treating sound is that is that sort of like one of the high high pitched Ronaldo and the Loaf singing voices is that what is that kind of de derived from that as well or is this more the the backward vocal stuff? Uh, well, rock cod voices are always the backward vocal things. Okay. Um, I don't consciously remember being influenced to sing like any of the characters in Doctor Finley's case book. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I'm sure there are the high pitched of... voice is just. I used to be able to do it then, you know. <laughs> and, 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 so is that that's you then, Brian? Eh, in the high pitched voice. Yeah, I can't. I can't yeah. sing to save my life. David, do you sing at all then? In in no, in. No, every 
every time I used to sing, my wife used to say, tell me where it hurts. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. So I think uh, I think there is one song that Dave sings. Oh, well, there is indeed. Yes. Yeah. He was, nah, she yeah, wears he, black. Oh, that's she, me yeah. doing the main vocal on that. She wears black. And what what album is that off of? Uh, well, it originally oh, came out on a cassette uh, as a compilation thing for a French or Belgian label. Okay. Um, I think we put it on one of the bonus discs on the is Clang the, Gallery releases. Yeah, is it on the one with um, yodeling? Okay. Right. Yeah, there. I think so. Hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll check it out and see if, if we can dig it up. It would be awesome to, to play it, but I won't put you on the spot there, David. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so where, where does the name Ronaldo and the Loaf come from? Well, it's back to the late 70s when uh, we used to, like with a group of friends, uh, go out for, to the pub on a Friday or a Saturday night. Yes. And the... People have been reading the uh, the Dice Man by Luke Reinhardt. Okay. Uh, and for fun, decided to uh, choose what pub we went to, what we did in the pub, or whatever. Usually, quite surreal things by the throw of a dice. Oh, cool. Uh, and basically, we uh, each then um, were christened, as it were, with dice names by another member of the group. Whoa. Uh, and those were the names we used when we went out uh, to the pub. And that's um, and that stuck, Ronaldo oh, yeah. and the Love. Yeah, I mean, for for my part, Ronaldo, my full name is Ronaldo Malpractice, and uh, well, we don't actually know why the guy that gave me the name gave me that name. He, he just yeah. sort of <clears throat> had a stream of consciousness and just said it. Yeah. Uh, and um, and Dave, your your one. What was what's your one? Ted, Ted the Loaf. Um, comes from the fact that at the time I had quite a big beard and the person who gave me the name thought it made me look like a teddy bear and at the time I just graduated with a degree in zoology so that the other part there's the I don't know if you're familiar with cockney rhyming slang no um, well Ted the loaf the loaf is loaf of bread head Loaf of bread rhymes with head, and someone who uses their loaf or uses their head is a, a, oh, oh. a brainy person. So oh, that's thank you, gentlemen. I'm, I'm getting right. we're, we're behind the curtain here with Ronaldo and the loaf on industry tactics. What a damn treat this is! Um, I really, really appreciate you guys taking us back, and I love the idea of. The stories behind all of this stuff that's become that's really a, a staple in a lot of weirdos lives and I know that um, now with technology getting the way it being the way it is um, it's really nice to connect with the community of weirdos that you've kind of helped build internationally right there's a lot of people you guys know this there's a lot of people that we're ser- are seriously moved by the work that you do, and and it's really nice to uh, to to kind of get that story from you of uh, of of where the name comes from, right? Oh, that, that's 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 great to hear. I mean, so uh, you know, we we lead generally quite insular lives, and uh, even in the old days, we were, you know, we were never we were never part of the local music scene. Is that right? Uh, not yeah. really. No, we weren't. I mean, people didn't even know we existed, really. Uh, Lo- locally in, in Portsmouth, then, when you were coming up, there was no, like, there was no feeling of, because part of what I, I'm doing with the podcast is talking with a lot of artists who do feel sort of like outsiders, and I wonder if that's, if that resonates with you, if there was that sense of when you started of, of being outsiders in music. I don't, I don't think so, really. Outsider is the right word. We were just, no. it's more, we were just ploughing our own furrow and uh, quite happy to do that. Yeah. I mean, it's like when we uh, decided to reveal some of our music in the first Struve Sneff cassette. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, we, we, we just recorded some songs and hadn't really thought what to do with them. And, you know, we weren't like, we didn't play live, of course. And, uh, and uh, it was really when we decided to reveal that we existed through that cassette 
that people in Portsmouth or the other bands really knew that we we were there. And and were you um, were you checking them out live? Like when you talk about the other bands, like were you friends with people in music, or was it more pe- friends with people in visual arts, or what? Ah. Uh, Neither, well, I, neither really from, from my part. I think maybe, Brian, with no. your connections with the art college and the architecture. Maybe oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I yeah, because I, I, no, we weren't like, you know, hanging out at that time when, when we did Struve Snev with like other people in the music scene here. Yeah, OK. Um, it was only after that came out that we were invited uh, to participate in a, a compilation LP of... Um, Portsmouth bands and uh, uh, and we which we did and we we had th- like three tracks on it uh, including Scottish Shuffle uh, and oh. then people knew and then we used to hang out at a particular like musicy pub uh, and um, we got to know a number of bands that way. Um, Brian, earlier but, uh, it's, earlier you had mentioned uh you, you sort of said of course we weren't playing live live and and that's interesting to me because so many musicians their path has that live music component to it i want i'm i'm fascinated by the fact has that always been the case then that you guys have not r- typically been alive i know there's a few live tracks that have just been released like the Bowie High thing at the end of st- the re-release well, that's the only one there is yeah. oh wow <laughs> <laughs> wow We've only ever played live once. Oh, my God. No, I mean, right from the early days, um, right from when we first started playing guitars together, we we recorded things. Initially on, um, you had that cassette recorder, didn't you, Brian, that we used to begin with? And then we we got a couple of reel-to-reel machines and um, gradually over the years got more sophisticated equipment. So this is, uh, you know, in a way, it's really like a, a, I'm fascinated by your, your relationship because it's been, um, is it more than 40 years? How's my math? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah more, more than 40, 40 years. years yeah. it, it's been over 40 years of you guys really, I mean, collaborating together, but n- not in that sense of playing the music live. It's really been a matter of d- d- seeing the relationship kind of grow over this collaborative recording. Uh, I, see, I didn't realize that. I, I thought you, at some point, were playing live together. That's fascinating. No. Quite yeah, beautiful. No, basically, do, doing, doing our music was very much a hobby. It's the kind of thing we did for to relax. And, I mean, we, you know, we had, like, certainly, you know, from, like, uh, I'd say in the... Well, actually, come to think of it, right from the beginning, we, we, we'd have, like, a regular thing. I think it was... Uh, was it Tuesdays and Saturdays, Dave? Certainly every Saturday, and then I think <clears throat> evening in the week was um, depending on That's when right. we were both uh, both free. But I, That's I think right. the, I think the other thing about the way we worked was <clears throat> I think the thing for us was the the creativity of creating a new piece of music. Once we'd done that, we moved on to the next piece. We didn't keep playing it and playing it and playing it to refine it. <clears throat> so that we could play it live. Right. We moved. We just moved on to the. You know, what's the next project we're going to work on? Wow, G- guys, uh, yeah. it's so, it's beautiful. When we did get asked to play live to promote the um, that Portsmouth compilation LP, South Specific, uh, we said, uh, okay, we'll do it. Uh, but we can't. We knew we couldn't reproduce any of the songs of of Estruve Snev um, ourselves. We couldn't do it. Um, maybe partially because we probably forgotten how to play them anyway. Sure. And uh, and so we did a, a an improvisation, uh, which we often use to sort of limber up or or to actually get ideas and sometimes use parts of uh, live on stage. So we did an improvisation uh, with a, a tape delay system, which we pinched from Brian Eno. And this is back in the seventies. No, this would have uh, This what, is nineteen eighty. Amazing. And how did it go? How did it go over? Was it well received? Well, I think um, so. There's I clapping. Stay... <laughs> That's a good measurement. Um, uh, yeah. People, people said, "Wow, that was really alternative." Yeah. I, well, I bet. That's what I'm wondering is when you released that first tape. Um, how did the buzz? Like, how was it received? Were people freaking out? I mean. 
Well, if they were, they were doing it privately. Yeah. Um, a good private freak know. out. Yeah, you don't know. So, I, like, I just, that's the one of the only gauges, if you talk about the, the title of this podcast, Industry Tactics, playing live is really one of the, the, the few gauges of our people, how are people reacting to this? But so I'm interest, interested to see how your, your, how your music caught with, uh, with others, like other, other weirdos even. Sorry, I mean, so we only ever collaborated with um, uh, a couple of other local musicians maybe, like the okay. flautist that we played with for a while. Uh, and then we had a, a cello player come in for one afternoon and uh, we, we did a jam with him. Uh, so, but Dave, um, Dave I, I think the, violin, uh, hmm? the violinist who played on Bearded Cats. <clears throat> oh yeah, that's Dave right. Baker? Yeah, Dave that was Baker? a guy from the art college. Okay, so who went to the art college? Oh uh, well, I, I I did some teaching there, and I left I, I left the school of architecture, finished architecture degree and master's degree and stuff like that, and then went to um, was asked to go and do some visiting lecturer stuff at the local art college and that way got to got to meet various people like wow. photographers and all that and there was this guy one of the lecturers uh played violin and uh, dave you never met him did you i never met him no no wow wow <laughs> <laughs> I just came up to our i came up to my place one evening and i said oh well, this is something we're working on which was bearded cats and played him the backing and uh he, he just i think it was second take he just played along to it and then we went to the pub so D david david you're a zoologist brian you're an architect is that right D or well, i'm an architect um I wouldn't call myself a zoologist. Most of my working life, I worked um, within the health service as a biomedical scientist. The loaf. The you you put so you put the loaf to work. You could say that. <laughs> and, and and Brian, um, so th this is just very interesting to me what your careers were and how you kind of fostered along y your music. Um, not necessarily as as traditional working musicians, right? Oh no, God, no. no. I, I think we really saw it more as a hobby. Yeah, uh, beautiful. A hobby that we took seriously. But... Yes, it's really. It, yeah, the music. The music is, you know, we've never earned a living with it. We, we, we're you know, obviously um, realistic enough to to work that out. Uh, and as Dave said, it's a hobby. Which, if it, if people liked it, that made us feel happy. Um, and then obviously we went on to sort of you know release various things, and I suppose it then built up into something a, a bit more serious. Um, only when we signed signed um, signed up to Ralph Records. Yes. So it's like fun, which then all of a sudden, eventually, well, sort of became uh, fun extra, if you like. That uh, more and more people were hearing it. There was product and reviews and all that stuff. Uh, but it, it wasn't really, we weren't like sort of like starry eyed kids saying, hey, we want to be famous or anything like that. It, it all just happened um, organically, really. Well, you're, you're reminding me of um, there's a renowned noise band here in Canada. You, you may have heard of them called the Nihilist Spasm Band. Oh, yeah. And, and you've heard of them. They build their own musical instruments and they, they still continue to this day. And what really fascinates me about what how they kind of. Exi have existed is uh, is it's more about hanging out and and making music and sharing this relationship but for them it's been I think over 50 years that they continue to record and tour and do their thing you know and a lot of what you guys are saying is reminding me about that even from the fact that you kind of come to music from different backgrounds and I think there's something there guys like it's one time too many that I notice um, a bar medical scientist and an architect making music together, this is kind of the sound that comes out of that very rich friendship that you guys have, you know? It's it's t t very beautiful to me. Oh, well, it's cool. I mean, it's like we, you know, I think you're right. It, when you said it's like a way to hang out, uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's friendships, you know, you need well, friendships um, work and stay together because of mutual interests, Yeah, you know? And... And so, you know, the friends hang out. So if we got this mutual interest, then we just did that. We just played music. 
hmm. recorded music. Yeah. Um, and then the difference is with uh, with uh, conventional bands, uh, you place an advert in a uh, in the local press or in a music paper. A guitarist wanted for a band, yeah. so you you come together as musicians. Uh, and you may or may not be friends. And w when you hear what goes on behind the scenes in some bands, it's quite obvious that they're not friends. Yeah, or yeah. If, or if they were friends, uh, quite often, quite quickly, they they cease to be friends. Yeah, yeah. Whereas uh, I think it would be true to say that with Brian and I, we were friends first. Wow. And remain friends, and the music is uh, is just part and parcel of that. Well put. Well put. And, and and what are what are your music educations like? I mean, d are you formally trained, or it's not that I care? <laughs> yes, thank you for your laughter. I appreciate that. I've, I appreciate that and embrace no. you both. <laughs> Basically, we both when we both sort of started grooving off on Tyrannosaurus Rex, we yeah we both went and bought acoustic guitars. Okay, and figured well we need to learn to play these things somehow. And I mean, the first things we actually recorded were just like very simple two string plucking and, you know, extremely primitive and sort of wonky singing as well. And uh, but then we went to the uh, music teacher at school and asked uh, asked him to teach us some chords and stuff like that. And we took a, the nearest we could get, get to anything we were interested in was a book of folk blues songs. OK. Uh, at which he proceeded to play to us, but he had no idea what folk blues sounded like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so he sang it in a classical way. Oh. He played it in a classical way, um, which we thought was really funny, but it taught us nothing. <laughs> so we we decided to ditch that, and we just said, well, okay, we can buy a book and we can learn how to play, you know, C, G, and F and stuff. Yeah. Uh, if we want, yeah. and then just taught ourselves. Our, where, who plays clarinet? Well, I used to play clarinet. It's Dave. I've, I've not, I've not actually touched the musical instrument uh, in anger for about twenty-five years. No, probably more than that, actually. Okay, wow. But the the sounds you've 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 made with it. I mean, I'm just also thinking of you know your sound is so special and your laughter enough. Uh, when when I said what was your music education like, that was the answer I was looking for. You know, it's I'm fascinated by how you get these beats. Like some of your music is 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 scary. Some of your music is is so happy and joyous, and then you get these beats that it's it's very danceable. Like I'm thinking of that song. I don't know the name of it, but it goes. Um, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What, what's that song? Critical Dance. Oh, that's Critical Dance. Isn't it? Critical Dance. Like, that is a dance song. Like, like what, what, what did you use to make that, that beat, that drum beat? Like, if, you, if I may. It's a loop again, isn't well, it? It's, it's a loop again. I can't remember what, what we used for that. Can't remember. Guys, you're making my life here. Eh? I hope you know that. Oh, it's, yeah. Well, hopefully we're sort of not too boring. <laughs> Are you kidding me, man? No, come on. No, this is a, this is a really great moment. I think one of the things you were talking about the sound with the clarinet. I mean, part of the reason for that with the clarinet was the, the clarinet was the cheapest wind instrument that I could afford at the time. Cool. I would like to have bought a saxophone. So the clarinet sounds the way it does because it's me trying to make it sound like a saxophone, basically, and. That also ties in with the way we um, approach playing the guitar, uh, particularly in, in this sort of uh, Struve Sneff songs for Swinging Larvae. Synthesizers were becoming very popular, and we couldn't afford a synthesizer, so we tried to make our guitar sound like synthesizers. Amazing. That's right. We, we tried to mimic things, and been trying to mimic them, they go wrong, but then make something else. You know, if we uh, wanted uh, a particular, oh, let's, as Dave said, let's make the clarinet sound like the uh, the saxophone. That was largely, I imagine, you know, done through using um, an effects pedal or something. Yeah. You know, so you could yeah. fatten the sound up or multi-track it. Yeah. But in the end, it didn't sound like a saxophone. It didn't sound like a clarinet. It sounded like a, a third instrument. Yeah. And that's what I find so attractive is the, is the production and the experimentation in your music. I... 
I, I think about the gear that you use. Is it? Are you both gearheads? Do you have a lot of gear, or like, uh, like how how do you? Uh, I don't know. How how does that whole world work? Like, it sounds like you're. Very, it's very almost minimalist, making the most out of a, an eight track or a four track, or now. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's, it was always making the most of the resources we had and um, pushing the resources into areas that they probably were never intended to go. Um, if we ever did get a bit of uh, a new piece of equipment, we always um, tried to find out what it would do if you did things with it that you weren't really supposed to do. Well, an aerosol <laughs> can, right. you know, an aerosol can tells me that you'll squeeze music just to, out, out, out of just about anything, right? Yeah, well, what that came yeah. about is that, like, you know, in the 80s, the early 80s, there were always the syn, syn drum sounds, you know? Yeah. Electronic yeah. drums, you know? Yeah. And you would get the that sort of thing. Yeah. And we didn't have anything that would go And so uh, we found, oh, actually, this deodorant spray makes a sort of a sound like it. And, and actually, was that looped or did I, did I actually, actually play it all the way through? I don't think, I don't think we could have had. Um... Three and a half minutes of the Lynx effect. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but the room would have been pretty fuggy. Yeah. <laughs> so that's another reason. That's another way how you get that sound, eh? Yeah. <laughs> if you're listening at home, all, all you young tacticians, uh, you squeeze music out of just about anything and, uh, and, and be careful for your health. Like on Struve, Sneff and Larve, we yeah. you know using things that just came to hand as, as hacksaw blades we used, uh, uh, old, old bits of metal hanging up. I mean, things which nowadays people think, oh, yeah, I can sample that or I can get a sample. Then we just had to, you know, grab what there was. And like we wanted a bass drum sound on um, one track. I think on His Guava Donut, we wanted yeah. a bass well, drum we, sound. We just, it was a 25 litre plastic. Um... Uh, container. Is that right? Yeah. It was well, a flocking uh, agent or something, wasn't it? Yeah, that's what it held originally. Yeah, that's it's called flock original. drum on the record, but it was a it was a, a particular flocculating agent or something. Yeah. It was some sort of liquid. Wow. Um, and so that was used. Mm. But it's like on uh, with improvising things like um, uh, on street called straight. Mm -hmm. um, I was just the percussion make... sound there. D Dave made some drums out of cling film and pots and pans, didn't you? It, it was just one. It was just it was looped again, and it was just um, it was a piece of cling film stretched over a plastic cake mixing bowl, and then stretched the different tensions to make the different pitches of the um, the different drum sounds, and then all looped together. Oh, you're blowing my mind here, guys. This is like. Um... I don't know if you have this show in Great Britain, but it's a, there's a show called How It's Made here in in Canada. It'll it'll show you like how a school bus is made, or how licorice gets made, and and this is yeah, for oh yeah yeah I yeah, think it, think it's on over here somewhere yeah. Elbow is taboo, and uh, one of my favorite album covers growing up. I I re really used to fantasize those two elbows, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a bit of a strange story because we the, the the title of the album came up in a again with just a group of friends in the pub and um somebody just said it didn't they well i said it i think but we were t we were talking oh, about you, right. uh, we were talking about <laughs> we were talking about fetishes and why um certain things were acceptable and so why it was acceptable to show certain parts of the body and not to show other parts of the body and somebody said well what about you know supposing our elbows were um you know considered to be decent to be shown and i just said yes the elbow is taboo well you know it, yeah listeners at home if you want to go online now and look at that album cover and gentlemen thank you very much now i've, I've for the last 20 years i've had a goddamn elbow fetish and uh, I want to thank you for it. If we were on video, Rich, I could show you the elbows. They're on a shelf about four feet away from me. Oh, my God, Brian, you're blowing my mind. Maybe you could mail them to me and my life would t totally be complete. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Yeah, That's well, we amazing. Don't, I don't have the bra, though. I'm <laughs> no, that made it. That pulled the whole record together. <laughs> so, so wait a minute. We did the photos um, at the art college ourselves because some wow. bizarre, um, who was the label over here that was going to release the album, we gave ideas where we wanted the cover to be and they tried to photograph it. Okay. Um, but it didn't work what they were, for us, it didn't work the way they were doing it. That was wow. coming over just a bit too sleazy. Okay. Uh, and okay. Um, so 
the elbows were made by um, artists in London and so got them down to Portsmouth and Dave and I went to the, the art college and the photographer lecturer we knew there we we did the session and you know we actually they were photographed upside down so they were both put on a couple of sort of um, mic stands and then the bra was stretched downwards over them just turned the photo upside down are, are they marble no it's marble oh, they're, they're fiberglass oh oh okay well, I didn't think we'd get into that. The nuances of the uh, the elbow, the elbows from the elbow is taboo, um, and I'm really thankful that we went down that wormhole. Um, so, guys, if this I can, is your favorite, Rich. We just had to, didn't? Yeah, we? no, no, absolutely. Thank you for indulging. Um, but I want to, I want to just say, kind of, I reached out. You guys have been really good over the years to uh, to always be very supportive, and um, I, I found that to be charming. It's kind of like having a a teacher in high school who believes in what you do and and I really love that so you know I, I, I reached out what a couple of months ago when I heard this new record of yours called Gertie Herding and um, and I think I, I, I freaked out alone as I usually do to listening to your music and my best friend Matt and I were going back and forth and then I thought to myself you know he was saying the same thing that it sounds like it was made um, it's very difficult for me to say. Like I think I emailed you this. It's it sounds like it was made like just right after the elbow is taboo. And then it also sounds like it's from the future, like all of your music. So I wonder how the heck you've managed to um like your your sound just continues to be awesome. It's not like like some some people over time different things can happen to their sound, right? But um, this sounds just as out there as everything else that you guys have done and I, I don't I don't know how, how the heck did you manage to do that? I don't know, but it's interesting that um, Gertie Herding, although it was 30 years after um, Elbow, it's very much, it kind of picks up the bat and where we dropped it 30 years ago. And I, I think had we the, um, the had we had the technology at the time, it, back in the 80s, it is it is the album that we would have wanted to have made to follow on from from elbow then and it's kind of some in some strange way 30 years later we've that's what we've done it was one of the last things we spoke about you know before um you know having our holiday was that we had both had an interest in medieval music okay right we developed right. an interest in that and we wondered how what what it would do if we sort of uh, approached medieval music in our own way um and that but that's this is the result of it as as, as dave says 30 odd years later wow. other influences coming in and 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 the technology to, to to make things happen amazing guys amazing um it just yeah as i said it sounds so fresh and i'm glad to hear you say that um and then, and then I thought, let me reach out to them and see if you'd come on this podcast. And here we are sharing the stories and connecting uh, via Skype. And I got to tell you, it's, it's very special for me. Uh, I really, from the bottom of my heart, want to thank you for, um, for making time tonight and speaking with me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. It's no problem. It's a pleasure. I'm a, I'm a huge fan, as you know. And um, I, 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 I wish you many more great recordings um if you if you're new to the world of ronaldo and the loaf check them out at ronaldo loaf.com or there's a facebook fan page immerse yourself in this fantastic uh, body of work guys is there anything coming up uh, like uh, like can we expect more from ronaldo and the loaf in the years to come there's a, there's a well we've just things. finished a remix yeah <laughs> oh yeah for, the, for an american band uh, called bleeding Controlled bleeding. Control bleeding. Band, yeah, an American band. They've been around, I think, since the late seventies, virtually the same as us. And they they um, they approached Clang Gallery, um, a label, and uh, invited us to do a, a remix of um, you know one of their songs. Unbelievable. Which we finished a couple of weeks ago. Wow, guys, that's amazing! I can't wait to hear it. When does that come out? Not Middle sure. of the year, sometime. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then if I can uh, give a, a small personal plug. In Please. 
in March, Clang Gallery are releasing uh, 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 a solo CD by me. So you, you both, at the same time, are, are doing solo work, is that right? Well, this sort is... Sort of. Uh, sort okay. Of. Um, uh, what is the name of the release, David? It's, uh, what well, the, the album's called The Entomology of Sound. Wow. And the, the, the name that I use for the solo stuff is The Darkening Scale. The Darkening what, sorry? Scale. Ale, like A L E? No, scale, S C A L E. Oh, the darkening scale. Okay. Well, I can't wait to check all of this out. Um, and and what is Klein Gallery? Is that a is that a, a label? That's yeah, that's the label. They're based in Vienna. Oh, fantastic, fantastic! I can't wait to dig into that. Well, they're the they're the guys that re no, we did all our re released. Um, Oh, right. uh, albums on right. and expanded versions uh, with them and uh, you know Walter who, who runs the label great guy and uh, we get on like a house on fire so uh, so it's just like a, a new Ralph Records really. is that wow wow great great it's just what we need and, and I'm thankful to hear it guys um, one last question what else do you guys do when you're not leading this international league of weirdos <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, well, I just I work. work. I now work in a charity shop for the Wales Air Ambulance. Wow. And I, I'm still working as an architect, um, uh, trying to forge a living, basically. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm a granddad now. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> All right, we'll play some of that more danceable Ronaldo and the Loaf repertoire for the, for the young grandson or granddaughter. Uh, it's, grand, it's a grandson, yeah. Right on. Uh, yeah, you, you do that, and I'll have to educate him when he's old enough to understand. He's only a baby right now. Right on, man. That's awesome. Can we play something off of Gertie uh, Herding to, 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 to sign off? Why don't we play, uh, what do you want to do, a pessimistic song in honor of uh, the state of the world? or? Uh, <laughs> yes. no, I think with the state of the world, maybe optimism is a... Uh... Yeah, let's go with scent, <laughs> s scent of Turnip. How about that? Oh, nice choice. <laughs> okay, we're going to end it with Scent of Turnip, another scent classic of, tune. Scent of Turnip is certainly better than Scent of Trump. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I couldn't have said it better, my friend. Um, okay, guys, uh, we love you and we thank you so much for uh, for the work that you've done. St stay on the line, okay? We're, we're gonna we're gonna talk in a minute, but thank you so much for the work that you've done, guys. I really appreciate your time here. Great, thank you. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Rich. Your your thank you, thank you. So we're back at it. Where do we find you guys now? At uh, you're at David's house in. Yeah, Rome? we're in we're in Wales. Yeah. Okay. What's the weather like? It's beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. Right on. And, and look out the windows, we can see sheep and lambs. Come on. Spread by fields. It's very nice. Wow, wow. Uh, it's a pity we're not on video, because I could have taken the iPad over to the window and uh, shown you what we're seeing. And they're <laughs> off. So we're into episode two here with Ronaldo and the Loaf. What are you guys doing together this weekend? What are you up to? Well, we're doing an interview with some guy in Canada, I think. Wacky. Yeah, you might know him. <laughs> Wacky. A guy called Friendly Rich. Okay. Uh, yeah, big fan of his work. Uh, big fan. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we're... That's what we, no, it's, it's one of... Um, I, I, t I come over and visit Dave probably about twice a year. And uh, it's up coincides. So, yeah, we're um long weekend together. Uh, just... Um, Talking, listening to music, going out for curry, nice, that sort of thing. And and what what are you listening to these days, guys? What did we listen to yesterday? Um, oh, we listened to Hector Zazu Oriental Night Fever. Whoa, which oh, is a, gr a right. great album. Mm. Uh, I, I mean, I never liked disco at the time, but the way he's arranged it is just fantastic. Okay. Um, Bobby McFerrin. Bobby McFerrin, uh, all just all a cappella vocal yep. group, which was good. Uh, an American jazz singer, I just bought an album of hers this week, Melody Gardo. It's an album called The Currency of Man. That's really good. Um, 
And that's for that's Yeah. 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 So are you guys buying records, CDs? Or are you? How, how are you listening to music these days? Well, I buy them as CDs, but then I rip them, and uh, I've got a small streamer. Uh, based on a Raspberry Pi okay. computer that I listen to most of my most mostly that or else um, Bluetooth from the iPad to listen to Spotify. Yeah, I listen to Spotify most of the time um, when I'm working and that. So discover all sorts. I've of things, just discovered so much new music over the last three or four years with Isn't Spotify. I'm on Spotify too, gents. I feel very connected with you at this point. And it, it's just so exciting yeah. to have all that access and, and to have seen it grow and, and develop since, well, the early days of you making cassette tapes, I'm sure, right? Or even so, or earlier than that, yeah. Mm. Mm. Oh, yeah, it's like, it's like a magical mystery tour going on to Spotify because when you get the, the suggestions for Discover and that, it takes you anywhere. And uh, so I hardly actually bother to get CDs off my shelf yeah. anymore. Yeah. You know what's really yeah. interesting about that is yeah. I, I, I'll use you guys as an example when I talk about, but you still need a hunger. Like, like the curiosity of kids these days having access to all of the music pretty much ever created, right? The, all, all that history on Spotify. But like how do you dig in? How do you get curious and discover Ronaldo and the Loaf? You know what I mean? Like I, I, I try to think of how I discovered you guys, and it's, it's really a friendship thing or a, a friend telling a friend. I don't know. It's, it's very interesting the way we come to it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there's so much material out there now. I do, you just, you can only scratch yeah. the surface, really. Yeah, I mean, most people in the old days, uh, people, you know, would have discovered us because we were on Ralph. And, uh, you know, people that like the residents would say, oh, let's check out Ralph Bands. And that's uh, perhaps how they found us as well. But not now. It's not like that yeah, anymore, this, of course. This affiliation. And I think that's what from, if we might get into our episode two here, um, I had such a lovely time speaking with you guys. And, and, and thank you for you know, your openness as artists and, and it's really, it feels like almost like a mentorship here. I'm really excited about talking to you again. Well, when you had mentioned, especially the last time that we spoke a after reminiscing, you know, wow, we barely scratched the surface on your collaborating with the residents, especially on the title and limbo record, right? I want to talk about, um, this episode two of industry tactics. We're going to look back on, I'd like to look back on the eighties and how this Collaborate. I've been listening a lot to that record lately, titled in Limbo, knowing that we were going to talk about it. I just want to know how how did that collaboration with the residents take place? Um, it's a beautiful co-release, right? Title in Limbo, and you don't really see that happening enough lately. I, I at least I don't. Bands collaborating together on a, making a record together. How did how did that come to be? Well, so they just uh, while we were there, the residents just came up with this idea that we'd spend four days uh, and we'd, we'd attempt to make an album in four days right from just improvising, jamming together to selecting the uh, pieces to work on to lyrics. We were going to try and do everything in four days. Yeah, so we were all crammed in this small studio, improvising, as Dave says, um, just seeing what would happen. And there was a lot of there was a lot of audio came out of that, which we we all together selected bits what, we what thought you, worked or had potential. And or what? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah it was yeah. A, I think put onto eight track. Um, and then we were supposed to split into two groups, weren't we? Uh, with well, basically the. Uh, if I remember rightly, and I'm, I'm, I don't know, but there, there were, the next thing was like overdubs and also lyrics, singing potential and all that. Um, and half the residents were going to work with Dave. Um, I think it was probably on overdubs and stuff. Oh, well, I wouldn't yeah. have been working on the singing, definitely. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I was going to work with... Uh, other residents um, on the uh, the lyrics, the singing, perhaps some bits of instrumentation, and then on the final day, we're all magically going to mix it into this album. Of course, it. Uh, we, yeah, it was. Uh, we realised about yeah. 
probably on the third day, but it was uh, the um, it was hopelessly ambitious. There was no way we were going to possibly finish well, it. Well, the residents weren't there very much. Were they? <laughs> so it, was, it was like uh, we did the jam and just agreed this, that, and the other. And I think it was probably by the third day it was evident that it would never happen. Um, so they basically shelved it, and we, I think, a couple of weeks later, received a cassette. Uh, with a, a little bit of post-production work done by the residents uh, on the selections we'd made. Yeah. And then it just stayed on the shelf and it was called Four Days, D-A-Z-E. Um, uh, that was the working title yeah. for it. I remember there was, there was one piece um, we called Disco Surrey. Disco Surrey, yeah. Yeah, because right. it sounded a little bit like... Um, is it from Oklahoma? Sorry with a fringe on top. So we like, called it, it like, dis it, 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 sorry. And I think the drum yeah. beat thing did a sort of a, you know, the sort of the horse sound and everything. And, and it had this, yeah, <laughs> disco sorry. Yeah. Um, the work and did, what did that become? Oh. I don't think it was ever used. Oh. That, that just uh, stayed there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was never used. Um, some, some of the pieces, you know, eventually sort of like came through on the final thing, but uh, you know, other wow. chunks of it just didn't get used. Like 90, early 1980s, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, those four days were... were 81. 81. 81. Yeah. Um, and had you, had you, you'd worked with them before, right? Like this wasn't really your first introduction. Oh, it was so. Oh, no, no, this the first, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're yeah we were, yeah, and that's your we first time. Beat virgins. Uh, I, <laughs> wow. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, for wow. what, my second time, but yeah, first my time. First, my first probably, time. But what's, it was this time, time really in a studio, wasn't it? Yes. We'd never, we'd never. Well, it was our first time of actually. Oh, yeah, because you'd always working in a studio you know. environment for us because. Well, no, we worked. No, we worked yeah. just basically in a well, like a bedroom. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the residence facilities were more sophisticated now, but I think probably the way they, I mean, they had their own studio. It was, uh, it was, it was like working yeah. in our bedroom, but a bit more sophisticated. Um, I mean, it wasn't like going into a uh, commercial no. studio where you got the pressure of time. Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, because you're yeah. paying so much per hour. You know, which is some, that's something we've, well, I've never done, I don't know. Yeah, so, yeah, that, that, well, that was different for us. And um, and then, as I say, it was just shelved and it was a yeah. cassette that just stood on, you know, was just there. Um, and we didn't necessarily forget about it. Um, right, right, but, right. But, uh, you know, we didn't think anything was going to happen until 1983. Right. We met up with the residents after the Mole Show in London. Um, and they floated the idea of basically completing the project, and um, so basically, yeah. sort of thought, well, yeah, all right, let's let's do that. Um, but um, you know, it's like, well, it was built because it basically it was going to take a period of time to do it, and I think circumstances were such that. You know, David's I couldn't. I couldn't have got three, three weeks, weeks off of to work to, it. to do it. Yeah. Wow! 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 Well, I took a bazooki, uh, which was in a big black homemade flight case that looked like a coffin, um, and uh, and uh, Dave, you gave me a, wow, okay. a box full of loop box tapes. Box of loop tapes. One of which. One of which Great. became the hey, basis for Mahogany, Mahogany Wood. Wood. Mahogany Wood is the only song on Titan and Limbo that oh. was created from scratch in 1983. It was because um, obviously, as Dave mm -hmm. pointed out, that the, the background loop, which is a great loop, um, created the song. And uh, I played the bazooki on it, and the residents played other stuff on it. Um, I remember. The bazooki had to be played and overdubbed probably about four or five times in order to give the texture. And since uh, I kept on fluffing, I had to do the whole thing from beginning to end in one go. Uh, and because uh, it was recorded on a 16 track tape. Um, and um, I remember that they, they basically, the residents just were sort of like, 
well, got to about take number six or something, said, look, I'll tell you what, we'll leave you to it. And um, I just left me there with the machine and I ended up eventually recording this bazooki stuff all the way through six times. Um, and um, then uh, basically we sort of you know, did the singing and um, I think it's the only track where the re singing resident and I actually have our voices on top of each other because it became very evident that my singing style and the resident singing style were so different that it just couldn't sort of gel. Um, but that one sort of sort of worked in a particular way. And um, I, I, don't, I don't know, I think um, it's a beautiful Mahogany Wood is, is my I'm personal favourite of the album. The, um, you're kind of touching on it a little bit here, the art of collaboration, like not having ever collaborated with the residents, I wonder, like just, I'm, I'm, I'm cutting back to 1981 here, what was going through your heads as you're as you're making that flight to San Francisco? Are you kind of are, are you nervous about it, or are you pretty cool? Well, we didn't we didn't know when we were on our way there. We had no idea. I mean, it was kind of intimated that we might do a bit of recording, but uh, the the idea of uh, trying to record an album was, you know, just um, kind of sprung upon us. Um, we we. Uh, there wasn't really time to think about it. Uh, well, by then, we'd actually been in the studio with them a bit. So I think we, by then, we felt comfortable being in the studio. It didn't feel um, intimidating in any way. So when the, the idea was floated of trying so to do the album, like, we just said, yeah, great, let's, let's, like let's, let's go for it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, we were in San Francisco for three weeks in total then. Um, doing, I don't know, obviously sightseeing and um, hanging out okay. at... 444 Grove Street, which is their HQ uh, for re records, and you know, getting to know everybody really well, and all sorts of things, you know, just basically hanging out. And um, but it was all crammed as you know, basically into the last few days of our stay. Mm. Um, but doing you know, doing the album uh, overdubs and working on it in '83, yeah. uh, that was that was real hard work. Um, the sense that the residents. I don't know if it's typical of the way they continued to work or whatever, but certainly for that, there was a deadline for the project to be done. And so it was a working week. We'd start at nine in the morning, half an hour for lunch and knock off at six in the evening. Yeah, I've read that elsewhere. That that's, that, that, I don't know about now, but at that time that they, I mean, it was very much like going to the office. They yeah. clocked on at nine o'clock and mm. clocked off at five o'clock, six yeah. o'clock. You know, they, they put in a full day's work on it yeah very very disciplined and uh and we've got i've got weekends off um <laughs> and so in basically the 15 working days the the album was was done um uh it was mixed on the last afternoon i was there and it was just time to get me you know get my bags there and get me to the airport um, so it was all very you know deadline like uh but I mean, it was it was great. I mean, the the way the album was done, it took the um, it took the the, the improvisation selections. Mm -hmm. They'd all be transferred onto a sixteen chat track tape, and they were used as templates in order to create songs with. And in some instances, the original improvisations pretty much got rubbed out, but are there in the spirit of what the piece became. In other ones, the more of the original improvisation is there, especially on Monkey and Bunny, for example. Um, that is still structured in a, in a, in a way which has um, right got a lot of the original improvisation we did into it. So eventually these these songs emerged. No, I didn't realise that about some of them being just used as a template. All of them were used as templates. Oh, well, yeah, but then not being actually in the final mix, so to speak. Well, they're basically some bits, I mean, some bits were replayed or uh, whatever that, you know, the residents had sort of listened to it a lot. you say that Snakefinger played some of my guitar parts again? He probably did. Yeah, but better. <laughs> <laughs> watching, watching Snakefinger yeah, play was actually pr pretty, uh, pretty guitar, excellent. Like, like something like um, the, the Shoe Salesman, was that, would that have been Snakefinger or originally David or what? I think of play guitar on, um, uh, let me uh -huh. think. Uh, he played violin on Africa Tree. 
it's on it's on the um, uh, uh, on the um, CD notes. It, it says there's, there's a couple. He played on two other. Uh, he played on sitting sitting in the sand, uh, and outro version. Um, and uh, the rest of the, the guitar work is and, is um, like basically a us. Singer in action. Big fan of his work. Oh yeah, thanks. I mean, he's just so professional. I mean, he just he basically came in, listened back to the the track, had a bit of a you know experiment around, and then base. I think probably did it on second or third. Well, mm-hmm. I think certainly by second take he'd done it, um, and just nailed it. Uh, which was uh, yeah, it was amazing. I mean, Snakefinger was such a you know a, a lovely guy, and yeah. um, you know we sort of. Uh, I mean, I remember when, when I sort of first got there, um, mm-hmm. and he came into the studio. He sort of said, "Oh, you know, shall, shall we jam?" And I'm thinking, "Wow, what?" <laughs> and, and I'm not the world's greatest guitarist for sure. And um, so I just got the bazooki and played a sort of a drone while he just played all this incredible stuff over the top of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and our jam lasted about two minutes <laughs> because, because there's only so much droning you could do. <laughs> Uh, yeah, anyway, so that, that was that. That yeah, was an so experience, I, yeah. It was see, great. I was thinking that you might have brought some of your aerosol spray cans or your mixing bowls, but it sounds to me like the gear that you brought was, in in 83 anyway, was, was nominal then. It was, it, was, it was a box of loops, eh? No. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, well, it was, it had to go on a plane, didn't it? I'm not going to... I mean, I'm sure they got mixing bowls in San Francisco, but um, uh, no, it was um, whatever I could carry. I mean, it was the bazooka. I had a sort of an Egyptian one-string fiddle with me, and uh, and a sort of a, a blowing blowable device thing called a mesmer. Um, I took um, just because I could carry them, um, and uh, yeah, and it uh, it was it was. Um, Certainly, uh, a major experience in 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 my creative life. Let's put it that way. This art of collaboration, right? It sounds like it got a lot more intense in '83 than it would have been organically spawning in in '81, right? '81 sounded like it was a very good time. The four days. Here's a project. Let's go, right? Yeah, it was looser. That's for sure. Uh, I mean, in you know the studio that um, we worked in at the. We didn't use emulators or anything like yeah. that because all the kit from the Mole Show was still in Europe, and uh, so we we could only use the instruments that um, were in the cupboard, basically in this studio. Um, and so a lot of the sort of more sophisticated, instru- interesting stuff was not available. Uh, and so we did it in a, very much in the yeah. spirit of um, uh, make do with what you've got. Uh, which, 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 oh, you know, yeah, certainly yeah, Dave and me, we're, we're, we're both yeah, used to that. Yeah, using what's to hand, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, um, I know there was one point we needed a keyboard and one of the residents nipped out the Macy's and came back with this really little Casio keyboard um, in order to, to sort of lay down some, some organ sounds and things like that. So, I mean, there's lots... Lots of lots of memories sure. from that time, but so, you know, it's not time to really how, go into them right now. Now they had released some of your recordings. Pr- I'm just trying to get a bit of a timeline there. You, they had released some of your work prior to this title in limbo, and you going down there to, to meet with them, right? Your, your work. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. When we visited when, when we visited in '81, it pretty much coincided with the release uh-huh. of uh, Larvae, didn't it? Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, yeah, it did. Hmm. Yeah. And by the time, by the time, you, Limbo Yodling was Yodling, Yodling was out by the time okay. before right, um, right. title in Limbo so, came so out. How, how did they initially discover you? I'm just wondering about that too. Like, it, was that just through a sharing of a share uh, of a cassette tape, or how did that come to be? Well, I'd gone on holiday to San Francisco with some friends and wanted to buy some albums at Ralph Records. And we just finished Struve Sneff. I took two copies of Struve Sneff with me to America um, and went in and but basically I phoned up beforehand saying, oh, can I come in and buy some records? Because it's not a shop. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, and because I had a British accent, they said, oh, yeah, all right. And uh, so I turned up and went into Grove Street and, and bought my albums I wanted um, and handed a cassette over and just said, oh, well, you know, this is what we've just done. And the guy that sold me the records took it into this um, sort of studio thing and mm -hmm. said, I'll listen to some now. And he only oh, played three or four tracks and came out and just said, um, oh, I think this is excellent. And I sort of looked and I thought, what? Well, okay, great, you know. Um, and uh, he just said, have you got any more stuff? And I said, well, we're always working. Uh, and, um, and that was how it sort of happened. It was literally by just dropping a cassette in personally, although they got apparently boxes of cassettes sent in all the time. Um, it was just that the person that uh, we found out afterwards that, that listened to it was one of the residents. And it was the resident. Wow, recommendation to Ralph Records. Stuff that you just happen to kind of, you know what I mean? They'd go in there and, and, and improvise that, and that is very much a timing thing, it sounds like. But it's also the beauty of your music standing out, I think. If, if they heard that, they must have been so impressed, I'm imagining, right? Well, it's like a lot of what's happened to us has happened by accident. And do you still... Mm. Sorry? Maybe if we just sent a tape, posted it to them, then... It would have ended up in a box yeah. and uh, your own adventure, eh? none of this would have happened. Yeah, it's just grasping the moment when it's there, but it's, it's, it's just good luck. And, and so and on, I on imagine that. it must That's have been really happened. hard mm. to communicate with <laughs> them back then, right? Like, or at least a lot more challenged than it is now. Yeah, I think we just uh, we had a letter from them, didn't we, saying that um, they yes. were interested uh, in uh, maybe releasing some stuff. Well, eventually, mm -hmm. and that's right. I mean, because they actually pestered us for more material, and we were just doing our own thing as we normally did. And there was these letters, so, oh, are you going to send us some more stuff? And so he said, oh, all right. And so we put together a promo cassette wow. called Songs from the Surgery, sent it over, and, and then cut two or three months later, we sent another one called Hats Off Gentlemen. And I think it was like middle of 1980, the, a letter just arrived out of the blue, mm. saying, our um, A&R guy is going to be getting in touch with you. Um, we, we'd like to put out an album. Yeah, yeah. And it was like, okay. It was like, well, I couldn't believe it, really, you know. Mm. Yeah. But um, those heady days of 1980, goodness me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that's how, yeah, that's, that's how, how it happened. I, I don't know if we really think about it, do we? What's that? that? How it sort of happened that much. It just... No, you just, it, just, it just happened. We didn't dwell on it, really. It was yeah. like, wow. I mean, they get the big high of, wow, we got the, offered this contract with the, yeah. you know, what we consider one of the coolest labels ever and all that sort wow. of thing. Um, and, um, and then we just got on with it. So that's what's kind of exciting about it is the idea that you you had these lives running parallel to th this this very strange music that you're kind of making and even the process of the way you're you're getting it done just sounds very natural you're not trying too hard but you're just kind of doing your thing right and it's it's very charming in the end as to how they found that and kind of helped ma maximize it or yeah. share it with a larger audience the residents uh, are playing uh, at a festival in North Wales in a month's time. Um, and uh, I'm planning to go up for that festival. Um, so hopefully get to say hello to uh, to them then as well. So yeah, we, we, we meet up, say hello when we can, that sort of thing. Um, can we, can we uh, let, let's play another track from, from Title and Limbo. I'd love to play Shoe Salesman. That's one of my favorites. Can you, can you tell me a little <laughs> bit about that track? Any memories? Yeah, I mean, okay. the the backing of that is one of the improvisations, um, and I just remember mainly singing uh, because I was very self conscious when I was singing because I mean, because the the way that the music came out was okay quite sort of structured in a residential fashion, uh, and I didn't want to be a a Brit doing an impression of the residents. Um, and so I was trying to figure out how to 
how to sing, speak, sing it, and, and my bits that I did. Uh, and I do remember sort of like just doing it. I think I was two takes and that was it. Principally, just one resident does the main singing. Uh, and um, that's you. That's yeah, you. and I, I play kazoo. It's a fine moment <laughs> in music history. And, yes. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Because um, I kind of I don't know really. I'd have to sort of stop and think. I can't remember or find it. It's, a lot of it is uh, reasonably fuzzy. Um, in the, if I sat down deliberately and tried to reminisce, um, I would get more detail. But um, uh, I, I can't remember any more than just feeling a bit self-conscious and how on earth should I do the vocal on this thing. Were, I no. The lyrics were all written by the residents. Uh, the, the singing resident always carried around a notebook and that notebook or well, would have ideas and lyrics in them and um, would basically mm -hmm. take some out and adapt as necessary for the songs. Um, so all the lyrics were actually um, done by, by right. them. Not, and David, not, uh, I, I, I'd kind of like to get into into what that must have felt like to um, when it came back in '83, having sent that box of loops. What was that like for you to just hear that final product? I can't remember at what point I actually. I don't think I actually did. You come back with a tape. Ta a paper. Yeah, I, I, I can't really. Re right, I can't right. really remember to be honest. Rich, it's a long, long time ago. Yeah, they, they gave us, um, yeah. uh, I was able to bring back a seven and a half inch per second mix of it. Um, and, you know, we, well, you know, we obviously sat down and listened to it. How any of this stuff was made. So I was really impressed with even our last conversation as to how much of the construction of these tunes you guys do retain. But I imagine this one was a little different in that sense, right? Yeah, yeah. I think so. I think it was it was different in that when we did our stuff, we we tended to keep um, sketch versions mm -hmm. of of songs uh, as they were being generated, and so we could listen back to them and remember how they were constructed. Yeah. Um, with that, with this one, it was yeah. just like full on, straight in at one end and out the other bands collaborating together it's and i'm just it's it's cool to me that you guys got together in this fashion and it's a co-release i don't see i don't see enough of that happening you know and it sounds like it just happened accidentally almost through hanging mm -hmm. out right i don't think there are too many uh, instances of that <clears throat> not many that i can think of where two bands well the only other one i can think of off the top of my head is slap happy and henry cow that's the only one i think of where the two who were quite well very different yeah. came together and made uh, albums together and uh, yeah very very successful marriage in, in a lot of ways but I can't think of anyone else no uh, I can't think you know it was it, was, it, it wasn't a designed yeah. thing I think it, you know it was like a fun thing to start and then it became a designed thing uh, because I think it's fair to say that um, after the Mole show that, that Ralph Records went through some difficult times and also it was an expedient thing to basically make a record and it helped us a lot, the, our 50% of the royalties um, bought us a 16 channel mixer, an 8 track Tascam, uh, some effects units mm. and, and I'm sure that it, it helped the residents and Ralph records, um, but I, I, you, you know, know, resurrect themselves as well. It's a really cool thing when you talk about that that marriage of of two different sounds coming together. I can almost like on, on first listen just go, oh yeah, there's Ronaldo and the Loaf, there's the residents, and you could just sort of see this this kind of little little. The overlap is is quite impressive, right? It, it's 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 a fun thing that you don't hear enough of. I mean, it's way ahead of its time if you think of the um mashing mashing up you guys were mashing up your both of your sounds back mm -hmm. then right yeah i think they, everybody acknowledges that don't sound like either band you know it doesn't sound like either pair it's not like you know just as you would expect if you get yeah, that and you, you, well, uh, um so it is a hybrid that, David? Uh, the bastard. Oh. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, you, the, you the bring, I mean, you didn't bring child. a lot of your your gear. I mean, it just sounds like yeah, it, it is a, it is the the bastard love child. It's very cool. Um. So so uh, what was I gonna ask? Okay. So also, can I assume that your association with the residents led to that incredibly strange video that um, Graham Whiffler did for uh, the songs for Swinging Larvae? That came about in 1981, when we went over in 1981, it was, um, well, we, we met Graham, didn't we? Yeah, he, yeah, he, yeah. While, while we were there, oh, he yeah. was shooting a Tuxedo Moon video, and we, we, we actually watched some of the, um, mm -hmm. some of the uh, scenes being uh, video. And um, there was talked about at the time about doing a video, and we had some discussion with him about the kind of things that we, uh, well, the, the songs we wanted to use, and um, some of the effects, like the back, the backward effects. We talked about that, but there was no discussion at that time of uh, what the content would be. That was the the content was. Um, pretty much down to to graham he he dug up the story and uh oh, yeah. well one of the tracks that we did suggest we wanted to use this guano for a donut mm. We, mm. Uh, with the which is like an adult and a kid ah. going along the street um basically the kid annoying the adult and um whether that in some way made graham think i don't know but certainly as mm. dave says like ultimately what was used the story um it's it's not something we would have ever chosen. No. Yeah. Um, it's a piece of art, a piece of film. Um, it's one of the first ever multiple yeah. track um, f music films, if you like. Uh, is is oh. very cleverly done. I mean, the yeah. sets are really yeah. interesting and good, <clears throat> and uh, film great. It's, yeah. As time's gone on, of course, the yeah. subject matter has yeah, got extremely that, touchy. Going, uh, wow, yeah. this would have been made if it was 2017. I mean, it's just, it's, what a masterpiece, though, right? It was done in innocence. I mean, the, the thing is, it's a true story from a San Francisco newspaper um, where this, this yeah. guy was nuts, uh, kidnapped a, a, a young child. Not Nothing sexual in it whatsoever, um, but he was looping and wanted a playmate basically um and it was about you know that's what graham based it on um so but of course now adults and children everyone thinks it's a yeah. it's his extremely sensitive subject uh, yeah. worldwide yeah what a, what a strange output with the soundtrack it's just it's a real coming together we had very little to do with it actually apart from <clears throat> you know we were god knows how many miles away mm. uh, we would and no email and we didn't even get to see it for no, several didn't. years mm. afterwards it's about 1983 before mm. we got to see it um we, they sent us a, a real a film you know on a reel but we had no means mm. to play it uh and then we lent it to Double Vision, who were doing one of the first video cassette magazines, and they featured it on there, and that's where we got to see it. One of the funny things about it, though, is something that I only learned so within the last year reading. What's it? Is it Ian Shirley's? Ian, Sh Ian Shirley's, Shirley's book. Ne okay. uh, was it never? What's it called? Never known questions. Never known questions. Never known yeah. questions. There's a bit in there about. Um, Graham Whiffler's work with uh, with Ralph Records, and apparently, and I we had no idea about this at the time. Apparently, it cost twenty thousand dollars to make the songs for Swinging Lavo video, right? Which was a big sum of money. Well, I mean, it's a mm. fairly big sum yeah. of money now. It was a very big sum of money back in nineteen eighty one. And I just when I read that, I, I said to Brian, if if in uh, 1981 ralph yeah. records has said well we've, we've got a budget of twenty thousand dollars you can we can either make a, a a video or you can have the you can use the money to buy uh, rig, studio equipment yeah, yeah, yeah i mean i know yeah. what we would have <laughs> which we would have opted for <laughs> and it wouldn't have been the video <laughs> wasn't, there something in the book, wasn't there something in the book about they had to film it all again because it was out of focus. It was out of, a lot of it was out of focus and they had to refilm it which oh, I, probably I would have thought it would accounts have for the, the um, um, some of the cost. The yeah. red liquid. That's got to run a bill, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
you, you should check out Ian Shirley's book. It's got some really interesting stuff in it to, to read that adds mm. a lot of mm. nuances to the, the Ralph Re resident story as well. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, It really makes me wonder, like, when, when you see a video like that, do your friends and family, when you show that to your friends and family or just in general, what are they... Th it's not the sort of thing I would do, Rich. Yeah. <laughs> I think I, sh I showed my wife the video when I was good to I mean, actually it was my before we were married and she still married me um but uh yes, when exactly. they showed you know they used time. it um yeah. in the resident icky flick show um, and where the resident did a, a cover version of our songs for that and uh mm -hmm. it, this was in uh, i think queen elizabeth hall or royal festival right. or in london hundreds of people and they showed the film and you could sort of sense there was like this, oh, I don't know, really. It was like, not yeah. shock, but total engagement into it. But it was like they'd never seen anything like it before. And I say, if it wasn't for the, the subject matter, it would be considered a great yeah. art yeah. piece, if you see what I mean, as a piece of film. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I know I just sat there and I know I, I sort of like... Um, Went hot and cold. Saw it on that Icky Flicks tour, I guess it would have been, in Toronto, and same same reaction. You just saw, you kind of felt a wave over the crowd. Mm -hmm. go, what the fuck are we watching? This is, um, it was amazing. I mean, it, but, um, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I wasn't sure how much of a hand you had in it at that point, and I just went, wow, this is the, one of the ones that got away uh, that I'd never really checked out from your work, so it brought me right back to your work, you know? Well, you should yeah. look on look on YouTube because um, somebody posted it some years ago and had over two hundred and sixty thousand views or something. Okay. But the comments are that sounds fun. are really that interesting. Like a fun time, I will do that and recommend our <laughs> listeners do too. Um, I, I, just as we wrap up, I want to I want I want to end with um, sailor song, if if you will indulge me. For, but uh, before we we cut to that, just. I guess the question applies too to your music. What do your overall now, apart from title and limbo, what do your friends and family do? They know how kind of legendary you are. How, do, how does it work when you're out there in Wales looking at the at the sheep walking by here? Do the sheep know? Well, no, no definitely, definitely not. not. <laughs> I mean, I mean, a lot, a lot, a lot of people, people that uh, friends, friends that I made, made here in Wales, they, they, they don't, don't even know that I do music. I mean, I mean it's, it's not the sort of... of unless, unless it cropped up in conversation, conversation which it, by and large, it doesn't, um, it's, it's not, not in my nature to really go out and say to people, by the way, uh, I'm a musician, I've made X number of albums, and we've got, the, we've got one of the strangest cult music videos of all time. It's just not... It's, it's just, just not, not my nature, nature to do that. that. A real treat, how <laughs> time flies. Our monthly check-in with Ronaldo and the Loaf. I'm hoping this can become a, a bit of a tradition. I just love chatting with you guys. It's a real pleasure. I, I, I really appreciate you making time again to, uh, to kind of go even a little deeper with, uh, with what we missed in, in round one. Oh, oh that's, that's all right. right. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a pleasure. It's, it's fine. fine. Yeah.